last session in that we actually have a lot more discussion time at the end of every session. And uh, in the slide, uh, the introduction slide, you'll see how you can ask questions either during or shortly after the session. And it's real life. So you can live and then we'll respond to you. While we're waiting, we also invited commentators to make remarks uh, and discussion on important messages during the talk. Time. And, um, uh, and also we'll then ask and answer questions from the general audience. Uh, there's a lot more direct interaction between you and the speakers. Uh, there'll be a chat box. And if you can't answer the questions in time during the session, then the answers will be posted on the chat box for you after the webinar series. Just for information, the next webinar is on master's class in uh, reversal of the replacement. So keep an eye on that and we'll announce that at the end of the webinar. I encourage all of you to join us uh, as members of the APO Hand Up Limb section if you can, uh, so that you'd be more engaged with us as well. And just a reminder, at the end of the session, it will send you a, a questionnaire for you to uh, tell us and please answer in frank and open manner about the webinar, how we run, what should we improve on? And that's important before we give you the certificate of uh, compliance or attendance. And your comment obviously will be held in strict confidence. I now open to the first session and uh, Margaret Falk will then introduce uh, the speakers. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you, Ted. Hi. Um, so, um, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, it is a privilege that we will have two esteemed risk um, orthoscopists and surgeons who's going to talk to us about perilunate dislocation. We have um, Jeffrey Yao from Stanford, USA, as well as Dr. Liu Bo from China. So, Jeff is the professor of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Stanford University Medical Center. He's also the director of the Hand and Upper Extremity Surgery Fellowship Auto um, and Orthopedic Surgery of, this, of Stanford University. He's been awarded by ASSH as the Sterling Bernal um, Traveling Fellowship in 2015. And he's a very experienced risk surgeon and has published over 150 articles. His talk will be on an overview of the paralunic dislocation. The other we have is Sato Lobo. Again, is a very well-known risk surgeon. He's a consultant and assistant, an assistant of the chief of the Department of Hand Surgery in Beijing, Jisui Tan Hospital. He's associate professor of the Department of Hand Surgery, Peking University. He's the chairman of the Education Committee of Asia Pacific Risk Association, as well as the course coordinator in China region for the EWAS International Risk Arthroscopic, um, Arthroscopy Surgery and Society. His talk is going to be on how do we manage perilunate dislocation arthroscopically. So without further ado, let's have Jeff to give the talk. Remember everyone that you can ask any question at any time in the in the chat box at the um, at the below of the slide. Um, yes, so Jeff, please. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. I'm just sharing my screen. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great, well, thank you very much. And, and thank you for inviting me to participate. It's a big honor for me um, to participate. Um, very happy to join you all today. I see many uh, close friends that I've uh, grown to know over the years. These are some happier times uh, when we could actually meet in person and spend time and, uh, with each other. And uh, here are some, just some photos of, of the many faculty members that will be uh, participating today. So thank you again for inviting me. This is where I'm from, Stanford University in uh, California. This is the Pacific Ocean and um, that's where I am. So in, in reality, I am part of the Asian Pacific uh, group because I am on the Pacific Ocean, just the other side. Uh, this is my email address. So I'm happy to uh, take any questions uh, or if anyone wants to come visit us, um, we're always happy to host visitors. Okay, so I'll be talking about perilunate injuries, and I think it's always relevant to uh, go, uh, refresh the anatomy 
Um, remember ligaments of the wrist are static structures that guide and constrain motion of the carpus. And in the wrist, we break them down into intrinsic uh, ligaments, which are entirely within the carpus, such as the interosseous ligaments, or extrinsic ligaments, which cross the joint, either the radial carpal joint or the mid carpal joint. And when it comes to instability, malalignment does not equal instability. It's important to remember that, especially in our at least Asian American uh, cohort of patients. We often see, especially um, in female Asian Americans, congenital hyperlax risks, which may appear malaligned, but are completely asymptomatic. We'll often see scapulonate gapping, but uh, a completely asymptomatic patient with a normal scapulonate ligament. So instability is really an abnormal transfer of load across the carpal joint with abnormal motion and more importantly, pain. Uh, we typically use the Mayo classification of carpal instability, uh, whether it's carpal instability, is instability dissociative, referring to the proximal carpal row, non-dissociative between rows, adaptive, and in this case, what we'll be discussing is the carpal instability complex component um, uh, 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 concept, which is components of both the carpal instability dissociative and non-dissociative, i.e. the perilunate dislocation. So perilunate injuries, it's a spectrum of injury. These are typically high energy injuries in the, in the United States, many motorcycle injuries, ladders, scaffolds, things fall from a height, typically not from a uh, fall from a standing height. And it's usually forceful hyperextension with ulnar deviation and carpal supination, which leads to this injury. Mayfield initially described the progressive perilunate instability as this very uh, con con uh, continuum classically starting on the radial side at the escape lunate interval with stage one and advancing in the clockwise manner, at least in this right-sided wrist, to the capital lunate dissociation at stage two or a fracture of the capitate, stage three with an injury to the LT ligament, and stage four when there's a complete lunate dislocation. This has been widely accepted as the uh, classification scheme. We further classify these injuries as ligamentous versus bony injuries, greater arc injuries involving any fracture of any bone at any location, and lesser arc injuries being purely ligamentous injuries. So the Mayfield stage one classically is escape lunate ligament injury or in, the, in a greater arc injury escapoid fracture with radioscapal capitate ligament injuries. Moving around uh, clockwise uh, with stage two, we have a rupture of the capsule through the space of foyer, the capitate dislocation or fracture, and then stage three includes both of those injuries as well as an LTIL injury, but the lunate still remains in the lunate fossa. And lastly, with stage four, the entire carpus is forced dorsally, spontaneously reduces into the radial carpal space, and in the process forces the lunate volar through the space of foyer into the carpal tunnel. And that's a classic lunate dislocation, which we'll see. This is a commonly missed injury. Uh, it's very commonly missed in the United States in emergency rooms because people are not necessarily always um, very facile at looking at ex wrist x-rays. Here's a patient with a, a fall from a ladder, contains, uh, complains of numbness and tingling, and to see the classic radiographic findings on the PA radiograph with loss of Galula's lines and the so-called pi sign where the lunate becomes triangular shaped rather than the trapezoidal shape it normally should be. And on the lateral view, you can see the spilled teacup sign or basically the lunate is now out of the lunate fossa and flexed into the carpal tunnel. This is a stage four perilunate. The reverse perilunar injuries are just the opposite. So this would start on the, la on the ulnar side and start with the lunotriquetral ligament and then pass in a counterclockwise fashion to the scapulonate side. So the initial treatment of these injuries, first we need to assess the median nerve. The median nerve is often injured, uh, contused with a neuropraxia. And then the reduction maneuver is uh, adequate conscious sedation, uh, traction to fatigue the muscles. We hyperextend the wrist, we stabilize the lunate with the thumb, and then push and gradually bring the wrist into flexion and the capitate should reduce back into the lunate. Definitive treatment would then be either uh, arthroscopic management or open reduction and stabilization. When it ta we talk about open reduction and stabilization, this could be dorsal only, which allows that access to the dorsal scapulonate ligament, which we know is the most important and strongest part of the ligament. The volar only approach would uh, uh, 
give access to the volar LTIL, which is the strongest portion, the volar capsule, and we can decompress the median nerve if needed, or a combined approach of both. And then the concept of arthroscopic management with reduction in pinning alone, reduction in capsulobesis, or reduction with mini open ligament repair. So just, a, I know uh, Lubo will be talking about arthroscopic management, but just a, a, a brief discussion of this. I think it's very uh, valuable for the treatment of these injuries because there's less disruption to the remaining capsular stabilizers. There's less disruption of the remaining blood supply to the ligaments that have already been stripped, less development in the scar tissue, and we are able to evaluate other structures that may be injured. And this has been described by many authors, many of which are actually on this call tonight. So uh, we're very fortunate to have them uh, in the, in the uh, faculty, including our own Indoho Jian, who's, um, who is published on arthroscopically assisted treatment with no pinning. So Arthur, uh, uh, I'm sorry, with no uh, ligament repair, but pinning alone. And also Min Jong Park and, other, and his group uh, also looked at arthroscopic management with reduction and pinning alone with no repair of the ligaments. Lubo will talk about his, um, his um, uh, technique as well. And um, Lubo and Guillaume Hertzberg, as shown here, have provided us a, an abundant amount of wealth of knowledge in how to treat these injuries, uh, either arthroscopically or open. These are some images from uh, Lubo's paper with the surgical technique. And remember, rem uh, remembering that the lunate is the keystone to which the rest of the carpus is, is reduced. And now the difference here is Lubo uh, advocates for ligament repairs if necessary via mini open incision. I would say that I adopt this technique. I have not uh, fully adopted the pinning only technique, although uh, the uh, papers as described before um, show uh, promising results with just pinning alone. In uh, earlier stage injuries, I have adopted Christoph Matulin's technique of dorsal capsule lig ligamentous repair. Here's a, a Mayfield Warner simple scapulonate ligament injury. You can see the disruption of the scapulonate uh, space. And we place needles with a, a suture, a monofilament suture through the uh, ligament from the radial carpal portal and shuttle them to the mid carpal portal, tie them outside the body and pass the knot back into the joint. As you can see in this video. And then once that's reduced, you could see with, without uh, the ligament, you could see gapping, uh, without the uh, tension placed on the ligament there, you could see gapping at the scapulonate interval where I can insert the probe. But then once uh, tension placed on the sutures, you can see that closes up and you can see that really stabilizes it. I, I'll, I'll admit I was a little bit uh, skeptical about the power of this technique, but after doing it now several times, I, 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 I can attest to its its stability and strength. So this is a very useful arthroscopic technique to know. So you can see before and after the capsulodesis. However, for the uh, greater stage injuries, I do think that uh, there is a role for open uh, treatment. Here's a uh, stage four perilunate uh, fixed with um, a combined approach with ligament suture anchors to repair both the scapal lunate and lunate trochoidal ligament with pinning um, of all the bones uh, temporarily for about eight weeks. Stage three perilunates are always dramatic appearing, but remember as long as the lunate is within the lunate fossa, this is um, not a stage four, this is a stage three. In this case, what we elected to do is a temporary screw fixation of, uh, rather than cable wires. Um, and this is different from the RASL procedure where the screw is meant to stay in there permanently. These are meant to stay in there temporarily about three months. Um, and then they're removed. And I learned this trick from Jesse Jupiter in the group at Mass General in Boston. And the benefits of temporary screw fixation versus K-wire fixation is that you can allow these patients to start moving. I let these patients start moving uh, about two weeks after surgery. Uh, with the pins in, uh, you're not allowed, uh, you just can't move the patients early. And so this allows the carpus to maintain some motion and then the screws are removed usually about three months after, after their place. And here's a patient with a typical result. Now I should say it's not, this is a relatively atypical result because most patients uh, with periluna injuries, because it's such a devastating injury, do lose some range of motion um, despite appropriate treatment. Now, what about perilunate fracture dislocations? 
These are the greater arc injuries. There's a transcapoid perilunate injury. We could still uh, manage these arthroscopically. Often your first view is just a big um, uh, screen of blood. So you need to evacuate the, the hematoma. And once you've done that, then you can assess the ligaments as well as the fracture. Here we have the scope in the three, four portal. And you can see complete disruption of the ligamentous uh, attachments and there's the scapoid fracture as well. From the mid-carpal view, you can uh, remove some of the synovium. I do prefer uh, wet arthroscopy um, in certain situations, not always, uh, but uh, um, in the fracture settings, often I will use dry arthroscopy. And there you can see the, um, the fracture. We put a K-wire provisionally in the proximal pole. And then once uh, the, the K-wire is in the appropriate position, then we reduce the proximal pole to the distal pole arthroscopically. Once it's adequately reduced, then we could advance the guide wires across. Here, in this case, I use two screws to fix this fracture, um, but you can certainly just get away with one. And here's the patient three months post-op. Uh, here's another patient with a, a transcapoid perilunate. Uh, in this case, we uh, uh, fixed both the ligament and the scapoid. Here's another case, uh, a little bit more jumbled. You can see Galula's lines are much more jumbled. Uh, and this was a transcapoid transcapitate perilunate. So fixing the scapoid and the capitate in that scenario. Um, you can have all different variants. Here's a transradial styloid perilunate with a complete uh, uh, dislocation of the lunate, uh, treated with radial styloid fixation, reducing the lunate and pinning everything. Again, the lunate being the keystone. Here's another transradial styloid perilunate. So you can see multiple different fracture patterns uh, that you often encounter. What about complications of these injuries? The earliest complications, failure to recognize the injury. Um, like we spoke about before, it's commonly missed. Median neuropathy is common. Luckily, most of these are resolved when the uh, reduction is achieved. Um, and, but if there's progressive paresthesias, even after the reduction has been performed, this requires emergent carpal tunnel release. Uh, often you'll see MRI or radiographic evidence of concern for avascular necrosis of the scaphoid or lunate, but Avascular necrosis itself is relatively rare, as long as the radial lunate ligaments remain intact because they will continue to provide vascularity to the lunate. But you may see transient ischemia, and this can be uh, confused with the AVN and, um, uh, on the MRI. So typically conservative treatment, most of the time this results over time. Other complications, carpal instability. This is my concern with just pinning alone, uh, is that potentially you could lead to uh, a downgrade or uh, carpal instability with disruption of those ligaments long-term uh, with a dissociative pattern. And you're looking at an intercarpal uh, arthrodesis or ligament reconstruction. In a non-dissociative situation, then you're looking at an intercarpal or limited radial carpal arthrodesis. And progressive arthrosis has been seen in over 50% of patients treated with, um, uh, with perilunate injuries. The late treatment for perilunates would be a proximal oral carpectomy or total wrist fusion if it's missed. So to summarize, these are high energy, devastating injuries are commonly missed. So you need to scrutinize radiographs. Uh, we, should, we should all be familiar with the Mayfield classification, the spectrum of progressive instability. Uh, these patients should have urgent closure reduction and median nerve evaluation and early surgical management, whether it be arthroscopic uh, or a combined dorsal and volar approach or sole dorsal or sole volar approach to repair all injured structures. Typically, you can repair these structures if they're uh, identified within two to three months, but beyond three months, you're looking at a salvage procedure. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions um, and please use the question and answer box below. Um, but um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we'll wait for the questions till we'll have the discussion and then, we're, and then we'll um, have to and look at the questions and the answers later on um, at the discussion. So without further ado, let's have um, Bo to talk about um, his arthroscopic management of perilunate dislocation. Okay. I'll sh sh share my slide. Uh, Okay, so it's uh, my pleasure to uh, take part in this uh, APLE uh, webinar. Uh, good afternoon, everyone in the Asia Pacific. And also, uh, I believe uh, GF have different uh, time with us. Thank you very much for your support. 
and uh, I'm Dr. Bo Liu from Beijing Jishui Tan Hospital. Uh, this is my uh, the campus of my hospital. It's a Chinese National Hospital Center, which was built in a royal garden of Qing Dynasty in several hundred years ago. I believe many of you may have uh, visitors. If not, you're welcome to visit us in the future. This is a hand surgery department. We have 40 hand surgeons in my department. And uh, 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 also we have a, 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 a mentor, uh, Professor Wang is the father of a hand surgeon of China. I will have 40 hand surgeons and uh, we train 80 hand fellows every year. Uh, so Jeff has already uh, gave us a very, very uh, comprehensive and wonderful lecture on perineal injuries. Uh, I, uh, now I'll just uh, share some of my humble inference on uh, the muscle treatment for this uh, difficult condition. So uh, as mentioned, perineal injuries are uncommon, but devastating cup injuries. They could have uh, uh, fracture dislocations involve the, uh, mostly involve the scaphoid fracture. It could be a so-called pure ligament injury involve the uh, ligament around unit uh, carpal bones. So uh, a lot of carpal, uh, classifications and staging, but most of us, uh, I believe every one of you know of this uh, staging by Prophet Herzberg. Uh, his, uh, his many dorsal and volar most of the case are dorsal dislocation. And you see in dorsal uh, dislocation, you have, uh, uh, have subdivided into uh, two uh, subtypes. So current practice, we always do close reduction emergency room. You know, we try to do early open surgery, though we do roller or dorsal or combined approach, as Jeff had mentioned, as we have a lot of debate on this. And we're trying to address the scope of fracture as well as the ligament or capture conditions. However, we all know that the, well, not like hips heroes, the current practice for perineal injuries is not so perfect. Evidence has shown that the prognosis of the injury is relatively poor and most patients experience the loss of grip, strength, and motion. And sports and heavy labor are rarely possible before six months. The patient usually requires 12 months of continuous rehabilitation to regain good function. So it's clear that open surgery introduced additional surgical trauma to the important capsule ligament structures and capsule leg scaring may cause stiffness of the joints. There's a chance, also there's a chance of damage already tenuous blood supply to the scaphoid and the bone ligament. And also there's a damage of the proper substance of the wrist joint, which is very important for the, for the uh, people who uh, rely on his wrist for his uh, uh, hobbies and sports. So any alternatives is ascorbic management possible? So our old friend, the president of, of uh, EWAS, the former president of EWAS, Professor Hesberg, is one of the most famous surgeons who uh, had a lot of research on uh, coping instabilities. He was invited in a paper in Journal of Hand Surgery 2008. He put that the ascorbic treatment present an interesting option. Although it is technically challenging, it may encourage healing with less stiffness, but at that time, there's no service available to support this notion. So now we can say it's possible because uh, case of arthroscopic management of perineal injury in the literature is coming more and more. You can see I have uh, uh, put some of my, uh, Jeff also mentioned that some of the, uh, our Korean uh, friend actually have uh, done a, uh, many uh, pioneered uh, work on this uh, difficult condition. So it's, uh, it is possible, however, is it also a favorable alternative? This is my patient. I have about 40 cases in a, uh, in a five years interval. And most of them have a uh, more than one year follow-up. So we try close reduction at the emergency room, but we all know that if we try close reduction, it is not always successful. So if this failed, what is next? Maybe if you think it's not strong enough, you try to find, find someone to help you. Yes, of course, in my country, we can always find someone who's more stronger than you. However, we found that see, the close reduction, the blind repeated forceful close reduction 
may lead to secondary damage to the capital, uh, capital cartilage, which is, is shown here. So uh, 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 algorithm for class reduction of the, uh, of the dislocation is we just try a single attempt of close reduction, avoid repeated force for close reduction. If the close reduction fail, we will proceed to a scopy assist reduction AAR. We use a, uh, you can use a, uh, a probe like a shoe hole maneuver under the uh, uh, assist of the uh, uh, traction tower, the traction force you can help you to reduce the, uh, reduce the uh, dislocation. So let's see why you, you cannot achieve close reduction. So this is a distal scaphoid, this is a proximal scaphoid. You can see this is a uh, gross displaced fracture, it's a capitate, this is a, you can find the reason that you cannot achieve close reduction is the, because the, uh, the capital actually is uh, block the uh, reduction of the uh, new nade as well as the uh, proximal fragment of the uh, mm -hmm. scaphoid. Under the traction force of this uh, resource you can have an op opportunity to unlock the dislocation and you can use the probe to reduce the dislocation uh, elegantly and with everything under control. There's no worry about the uh, uh, iatrogenic uh, cartilage damage. So how about the, uh, the uh, uh, percutaneous fixation of a scaphoid without arthroscopy? So uh, previous authors has uh, shown that the percutaneous reduction and fixation for transcaphoid perineonic fracture dislocation under uh, fluoroscopy control only, we found that many of the pa some of the patients with unreduced scaphoid may lead to radio uh, risk pain and has a bone spur at 10, 10 months after initial surgery. So uh, you can see uh, uh, after the uh, reduction of the uh, uh, dislocation, there is also, uh, don't forget, there's also a gross displaced uh, scaphoid fracture. So with an assist of the reflexoscopy, you can have a, a better uh, understanding of the uh, fracture uh, displacement. And with the guidance of arthroscopy, you can have the opportunity to achieve an anatomical reduction and you can proceed to your percutaneous painting. So uh, it's a, we all know that this is the key to achieve the anatomical reduction of this intraarticular fracture with this con uh, difficult conditions. So also with our arthroscopy, we have an opportunity to, uh, to uh, uh, guide our reduction of the RZ uh, couple uh, alignment like the LT ligament, which is always totally disrupt at a perineal injury. The so LT uh, interval is, can be uh, reduced under arthroscopy control, and then you can proceed to a, a key white, uh, key white uh, pinning. So this is a typical, uh, uh, perineal injuries, young gentlemen, high energy trauma. So after the close reduction, uh, you can see that the, uh, all the, all the uh, procedure was done under the oscopy and the fluoroscopy control is uh, Im immediately post-op. And three months post-op, there's a, a scape fracture is healed and the alignment is uh, restored. Four months post-op, you can find the function is very good. You, you cannot tell which side is operated and there's no scar. So you can find there's a four months post-op. So it, it is quite, uh, quite rare to achieve this function when we do the open procedure before. So this is another scenario, it's a new nade dislocation without scaphoid fracture. So this is a so-called pure ligament injury because uh, we, uh, it is believed that the energy will go through the uh, ligament, ligamentous structure around the new nate. So uh, again, we can achieve the ascorbic assisted reduction and the percutaneous fixation of the dislocated SL interval and the LT interval. So as, uh, yes, uh, Jeff has mentioned, this is one of my paper that he, I, I will use an extended three, four portal to one to 1.5 one, uh, centimeter with two suture anchors placed on the new and the proximal scaphoid respectively. And the suture of the anchor were tied on the top of the dorsal capsule 
to reinforce the ECSS, which is now thought the one of the key structure of the SL interval, because we all know that if there is too much stress between the scaphoid and the neonate. So this maneuver, uh, this procedure will actually will reinforce, make a uh, good uh, augmentation to this uh, dorsal scaphoid neonate complex. So this is a patient, this uh, dog player, she came back to the field as early as three months post-op because we have reinforced of the uh, both the uh, uh, fracture and also the uh, ligament intervals. She's satisfied with uh, the invisible scar. She will go for another golf game immediately after the follow-up at 10 months uh, post-op. You cannot tell which side is operating uh, because uh, the function is really acceptable. The so couple alignment restored and maintained in 10 months post-op. So when you compare with uh, 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 with the uh, outcomes of open surgery in the most recent 10 years, you will find the arthroscopic uh, treatment has a little bit better range of motion, a little better risk scores, and a little bit quicker rehabilitation. More than the scores, the patient likes the mini research procedures. They don't like the, uh, sometimes they don't like the ugly uh, looking scars, they like the uh, inconspicuous wounds. So this concept of a perineal injury, actually, uh, uh, we have uh, come up with new uh, concept. Actually, it's not so new. In the uh, ASS, actually, four years ago, we have uh, uh, a friend, Jesse Jupiter, Gürgensberg, and uh, David Slarsky. Actually, we have uh, uh, put the first uh, instru instructional course in ASSH for the, uh, for the uh, ascorbic treatment of a perineal injury. And also, a uh, same year in uh, International Federal uh, Hand Surgery course, as uh, we have a celebration of the uh, uh, 30th anniversary of wrist arthroscopy. Uh, we have a uh, wrist arthroscopy past, present, and the future. Actually, we put this part of the treatment into in the uh, present part and not the future. So, in summary, the uh, arthroscopy assisted mini invasive procedure is uh, possible and reliable. It's promising short-term results, better range of motion, functional score, less scar. But don't forget, it is technical demanding. Be prepared to scope in a bloody and messy wrist joint. Sometimes it's really uh, not easy. And we're still waiting for a long-term result. And if any question about, the, uh, about this topic, the Q&A box is just below your uh, video window. So should we change our practice for uh, perineal injury from now on? Uh, uh, should we still do a uh, close reduction in emergency room? Yes, we still do it, but uh, do not avoid the uh, uh, blind, repeated, forceful uh, close reduction. Uh, so uh, which approach is better, dorsal, volar, or combined approach? We have a lot of debate, but now should we also uh, think about the asthetic approach? Uh, it is yes because a lot of uh, evidence actually shown that it's as a it's as a option for for this. So for the surgeons, it may be technical uh, challenging at the very beginning, but it's worth a try. Uh, make sure you are not the last one to try. Thank you very much for your attention and welcome to Beijing again. We have uh, 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 annual gathering with all many of our friends in Beijing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, thank you, Jeff and Bo, for the um, wonderful presentation. Um, this stage, we started with the questions. And so, and we would like to invite um, Dr. Yong Gun Lee from Korea. He's the director of the Chongbuk National University. And he's, um, he's also a very well esteemed um, risk surgeon. And he's also the, the executive committee member of the APWA Asia Pacific Risk Association. Um, so we'll, so before Yong Gun starts the yeah. questions, um, I see that there are two questions from the, from the auto TV, um, line. Um, I think one of the, the two questions is basically, when do you prefer combined dorsal and volar approach? Um, I, I think that you guys have talked about the, that, that there is a possibility of doing dorsal or volar or combined, but when, but when would you do it? And is there any indication that you will definitely do a volar or open? I, I know that you guys prefer arthroscopically at the moment, but then I think for a lot of um, 
surgeons out there who are not very familiarized with doing wrist arthroscopy, they will want to see when, when they should do, if they're doing open surgery, when, when, when with, which approach they would need to use. In the I can start. I, um, I almost always do dorsal approach unless there's media, concomitant median nerve symptoms. Uh, the argument for doing the volar approach is you can release the median nerve, address the volar capsule if needed, and then also repair the volar LT ligament, which we all know is the, the strongest part of the LT ligament. Um, in my hands, I've done dorsal only approach in the absence of, of median nerve symptoms and repaired the dorsal LT ligament and have had satisfactory results. And so I don't, I don't really see the need for a uh, volar approach unless uh, I'm going there to release a carpal tunnel. So if yes. that's the case, would you do a combined then? Would you, or you just do a volar only? If oh, yeah. So I do think that I, we should repair the dorsal scaphalunate ligament. So if there's, a, if there's median nerve symptoms, then I'll go volar, release the median nerve, re, uh, address the volar capsule and the volar LT ligament, and then still go dorsal uh, to repair the scaphalunate ligament dorsally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, tw 20 years ago, when I was very young, surgeon, actually, I was taught by my seniors that uh, you should do Combine the post post dorsal and the volar because a lot of uh, this is a, a, a injury of a, a lot of uh, ligament injury, so you need to address all the dorsal and the volar uh, tissues, uh, uh, repair, try to repair what you have fine, and you, then you can achieve a better outcome. So I, I try this combined approach, and gradually uh, I'm to, uh, I find that uh, I have a lot of operation to do. I then I I, uh, just like Jeff, I just do a uh, uh, dorsal approach because I find it's uh, uh, easy for me. And uh, most of the time, I can do all the, uh, all the uh, reduce, uh, reducement and uh, fixation. And uh, the, uh, and the uh, outcome is not bad. And gradually, I proceed to a scorpion approach. I uh, just try to, try to uh, keep, uh, keep my, uh, can, cannot see what, what has been injured in, in the open procedure. I try to try to uh, omit the uh, the repair of the dorsal approach or uh, uh, volar approach or combined approach. I find is uh, the outcome is uh, not bad, and sometimes or most of the time, if not most of the time, outcome is better. So I'm thinking so probably this is uh, the way we are thinking. M many of you, I believe, most of you actually have uh, goes through this uh, this process. I, I now I I, I believe that. Uh, I will try the ascorbic approach first, but but for for the for, for how for this for those who do not use the ascorbic, uh, I think uh, it's uh, not a big deal that you choose a roller or a dorsal or a combined approach because evidence have shown each, each uh, approach is 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 okay if you do it well, but there's no evidence showing that which approach is uh, significantly better than other approach. Yeah, and I think we spend a lot of time trying to make anatomy back to normal when um, when it may not be necessary. And it's I think it's very difficult to ascertain when it's important and when it's not important. And I think um, if you look at the Korean literature that suggests this pinning the, um, pinning the bones without repairing the ligaments with still excellent results, and the question becomes whether or not we need to repair these ligaments at all. And if we're doing a combined dorsal and volar approach, think of all the soft tissue stripping, the devascularization, and also the scar tissue that forms. And so maybe you feel better about fixing everything, but the patient will be, uh, their, their range of motion will be uh, more compromised. Totally agree. Youngun, mm -hmm. any Oh, yeah. Ahead? Yeah. Hello, Jeff and Bo. Uh, Hello, uh, thank you for your uh, uh, lecture. I have uh, already, I have five questions. Uh, the first question, uh, I ask the first question, since the ferulinar dislocation is difficult to treat and the duration of rehabilitation is long and it is too, too difficult to estimate the treatment result, I think that some surgeons, especially young surgeons, might prefer the proximal carpectomy for primary operation rather than the reduction, uh, fixation, fixation or ligament repairs. 
what you think of the proximal or public meat as a primary treatment for the perinatal dislocations? Please. Uh, I can start. I, I, I don't. Uh, I, I don't typically uh, uh, advocate for that unless it's an old injury. If it's greater than three months old, I think the vascularity to the lunates has already been compromised, and I think um, repair A would be very difficult, and B would have a poor prognosis. And so, in those situations, I would uh, elect a PRC. But I wouldn't do it in the in the initial uh, setting, mostly because. Generally, these patients who are suffering these injuries are younger patients. They're high energy injuries and younger patients. And so um, to do a PRC in a 20-year-old or 30-year-old, I think is asking for trouble down the road. Uh, it is a faster recovery though than, than um, you know, if we have to do reconstruction and pinning or put, putting the screws as I demonstrated. So the patient has to be uh, prepared for a three to four month recovery. Whereas with a PRC, they could theoretically be back to doing everything by four weeks. So there is some element of that. If someone really needed to get back to work or something very quickly, uh, then, then that might be attractive to them, but it wouldn't be my first choice. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, oh, any comment? Yeah. Okay, okay. A second question. Uh, uh, it seems that many uh, surgeons may uh, have doubt whether it is possible to get a good result with uh, uh, cross the reduction and percutaneous fixation without performing the open reduction and the ligament repair. But uh, you said that the arthroscopic technique will be have a good result. What do you think about that? Uh, do you think you can get good results with uh, percutaneous fixation and the percutaneous reduction? Uh, than the open uh, reduction and open repair. So, uh, so you can you mean the uh, say the the close reduction and the percutaneous pain of this uh, injury, right? So, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to uh, yes. Uh, one of my slides uh, before actually have shown that the uh, because we all know that the key of this uh, treatment of this condition is you, you need to try to. Uh, reduce uh, anatomically reduce the uh, scaphoid fracture, and also you need to reduce all the dislocated uh, uh, carpal uh, male alignment to back back everything back to the normal, and let mm -hmm. the uh, uh, tissue healing at the uh, normal anatomical uh, position. So, uh, because many of the scaphoid fracture in this condition is really uh, displaced uh, a lot. And uh, we find that it's difficult to achieve uh, anatomic reduction under uh, fluoroscopy control. So particularly for scaphoid, it's very difficult to, to see the rotational displacement, the, some gapping of the, uh, <laughs> this, uh, of this fracture. So I think it's a key to, to use arthroscopy to, to uh, achieve, the, to make sure we can achieve a, uh, anatomic reduction if you do not open it. Uh, if you cannot achieve, uh, anatomic reduction closely, you need to either open it or you use the arthroscopy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to say, I've always been somewhat, uh, I'm familiar with the literature and, and no offense to our esteemed colleagues on the call, I, I've always been somewhat uh, um, concerned about just pinning uh, the bones without repairing the ligaments. Um, it's hard to argue with the results and, and it's not just one group. It's been two groups now in Korea, at least that have shown good results. Now, they're not huge numbers of patients, but, um, um, but I feel better um, uh, when, when I fix the ligaments. But this comes back to the previous question of whether or not we're doing too much and this may lead to a stiffer wrist uh, and may be unnecessary. So, um, so I have not yet done that technique. Um, I, I haven't had the courage to do that technique. I just don't understand why those wrists don't end up degenerating over time. Um, but, you know, yeah. I just haven't had the courage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw you, oh, okay. Uh, one question. more question? Yeah, there's yeah. actually a question from, uh, the, from the audience that I yeah. think interesting is, is they said that as a GP working in emergency room, when should we be suspicious of perilunate injury? 
obviously, um, Jeff was telling that there's a lot of missed peritoneal injuries. Um, so how, how what, what would your recommendation? Yeah, it's a, very, it's a very commonly missed injury because I think we're not always, uh, um, you know, in the emergency room looking uh, at these x-rays, uh, you know, as, as hand surgeons, we're looking at these x-rays every single day. And so we're very familiar with Galula's lines. So Galula's lines are basically the lines across the carpus, which should be nice and smooth and continuous uh, along the proximal articulation of the scaphoid lunating trichoidrum the distal articulation of the scaphoid lunating trichoidrum and the proximal articulation of the, um, the capitate and hammy. And so those should be continuous lines. There shouldn't be any uh, disruption. And if there's any disruption or the bones are, uh, it suggests that there's some um, issue there. And so uh, if there's any question, you could get advanced imaging, CT scan, or an MRI, but um, usually the, the x-rays, if you scrutinize them enough, you, you'll be able to identify the injury. Yes, actually, yes, actually uh, this, uh, for the patients with perineal injuries, uh, they actually the uh, simple uh, AP and a lateral x-ray, actually we will tell you all the information about the uh, diagnosis. So for, for me, my, Center, I, I if for a trainee to to need to who want to pass in my department, I will give this just this two AP and the better actually if they can got the uh, diagnosis of perineal injury as a pass of the yeah so, so yeah. Uh, just uh, really uh, look careful to to the uh, actually will tell you all the things for the diagnosis. And also on the exam, if the patient and, and the history if it's a high energy injury, if the patient fell from several meters. Uh, or fell from a high-speed motorcycle or a car collision, or and their hand is severely swollen uh, and the motion is very limited. And if you look at the extras and say, "Oh, they look okay," think twice about that because there there generally means there's probably more to uh, uh, than meets the eye. Um, you know, there's two more minutes. Do you want to have another question? One last question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeffrey and Bo. Do you have experienced any threshold while doing the arthroscopic surgery? That is, uh, what's the limitation? What's the limitation of arthroscopic techniques for the perineal dislocation? What's your so, think? Uh, uh, Yankonis, it's a very good uh, uh, question because uh, we, once we use arthroscopy, we try to do everything on the arthroscopy actually, but we all know that we need to know we have limitation. So for me, it's, uh, for the patients who cannot achieve close reduction, like the chronic case, more than uh, one one month or uh, longer, it's difficult to achieve uh, close reduction. We need to open it. Another case is uh, for the uh, patients with uh, uh, rough, gross, grossly displaced neonate, like summer case. Uh, the neonate is dis displaced, uh, displaced all the way to the forearm. It's, for me, it's also difficult or impossible to, to achieve close reduction. So this is a two, two of my uh, limitations for, for the procedure. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So thank you. Um, yes, yeah, just about time. I think we should probably end this session. There's still questions in the chat box. Um, I know that it's pretty late, Jeff, but I'm trying to answer it in the chat box before you go, before you go. and yeah I'm happy to I'm happy to yes so um yes so um yeah so without further ado um I think we'll start to we'll we'll proceed to the next session which is on elbow so it's lateral epicondylitis um, management and the moderator is Erica so Erica I will pass it to you so yeah, anybody you, Margaret. yeah anybody can you can still um put questions in the chat box and then we'll have Jeff and you're able to answer it in the chat box. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Margaret. Hi, everybody. I'm Erica from Indonesia. I welcome everyone to move proximally to the elbow session of the APOA Hand and Upper Limb Society webinar, which is the elbow session. We are very blessed that in the elbow session, we will have two world-class panels, Dr. Min Jong Park from Korea for the first talk, and Dr. Cholavi Chandalit from Thailand, for the second talk. Again, I remind you that the Q&A 
chat box are directly available at the Orto TV platform that you are watching now. So you just need to scroll down and you can find this chat box in which you can type your question directly and it will be picked by the moderator, which is me. And uh, I will try to summarize all the similar question to uh, the panels. So without further ado, uh, let's get to meet our speakers from the elbow session. The first speaker is uh, Professor Min Jong Park uh, from the Samsung Med Medical Center in Seoul, Korea. He is a very well-known elbow and hand surgeon and a prolific researcher who graduated the Seoul National University. Later, he did a fellowship at the Mayo Clinic, apart from being the current president of the Korean Society of the, for the Surgery of the Hand, he is also a violinist at the Medical Philharmonic Orchestra. And the second speaker will be from Thailand. Dr. Chalavis Chanlali is an associate professor at the Smithyfetch Srinakarin Hospital in Thailand. Apart from being an active runner, he is an upper extremity surgeon and sports medicine surgeon who was trained in Gothenburg Hospital in Sweden and also at the Mayo Clinic in the United States. At the moment, he is the committee of the Thai Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. So without further ado, let's welcome the Professor Min Jong Park, who will talk about the lateral epicondylitis treatment, open surgery management. Please, Professor and Park, the time is thank yours. You, thank you for your introduction. And hello, everybody. Uh, it's my honor to be invited to in this uh, APOA meetings. So I'd like to talk about the lateral epicondylitis, very common disease, uh, especially the open surgery. So everyone knows well which is the lateral epicondylitis. In slide on board. Okay. Let me share screen. Share screen. It's okay. Uh, no? You can click the share screen button at the bottom of your screen. There is a green button. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> okay, yeah. it's coming now. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, no you're question. good to go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is it okay? Yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. very clear. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. So the lateral epicondylitis can be defined as the ECRB tendon uh, micro tear resulting in the failure of healing and degeneration. So it's a kind of the tendinosis or it can be called as the encesopathy, which is a disorder of the tendon bone junction. Uh, so pain is the essential problem, or maybe it's the only problem and is induced by the nasal lesion, which is known as the angiofibroblastic tissue containing the toxic agent and the pain uh, abnormal pain receptor. So goal of the treatment is only one, the pain remission. Unfortunately, in most patients, the natural cross is self-limited, uh, usually within one year. So the indication of surgery is the persisted intolerable pain or over than one year. And when you do the uh, surgery, uh, what do you think is the key concept of the, uh, to, to eradicate the pain? I think the removal of the pain-inducing tissue, which is the nasal lesion, uh, is the key concept. I don't think we can repair because it's already degenerated tissue. And also the release cannot uh, doesn't work because the overloading is not the pain mechanism. So uh, surgery is very, very simple. Uh, it is enough to excise the pathologic tendon. What we can do uh, by open surgery, or we can use the arthroscope. Uh, actually, I prefer arthroscopy technique because it has uh, several advantages of minimal procedure while providing the comparable uh, clinical results to the open surgery. However, uh, the open surgery 
should be considered or uh, it must be performed in the following cases. As you can see in the MRI, the, if the lesion is very, very large, uh, we need a wide field to assess the lesion and to remove the sufficient tissue to, for successful pain relief. Or if the patients have the mass-like calcification, uh, I recommend the open surgery because the arthroscope is technically not feasible to see and remove the calcification. So we can remove the calcification by direct observation, and then we close the capsule. Uh, this is the reoperation case uh, due to failure of pain relief. We need to remove the pathologic tissue more rad radically. And after excision, we, uh, we usually can close the defect, but if the large defect is remained, uh, I recommend to use the unconscious transfer uh, to cover the defect. Now, I'd like to uh, discuss about the lateral collateral ligament insufficiency in the lateral epicondylitis. Lateral epicondylitis is basically nothing to do with the ligament problem, but the ligament origin is very, very close to the ECRB, so lateral epicondylitis has a potential to affect the ligament function. In this patient, the lateral collateral ligament is totally ruptured with the atrophic change, and the most likely curse is the multiple steroid injections. Or well, sometimes uh, after the debridement, uh, as a complication, uh, total rupture can occur uh, because of the excessive uh, removal of the tissue. So I always check the MRI before the operation. And frequently I find that the ligament insufficiency ranging from the partial injury to the total rupture. So if you are suspicious about the ligament injury, you better choose the open surgery to assess the ligament status. And stress test under the anesthesia to evaluate the stability is very, very helpful to decide what procedure we will do for the ligament. So if there is a only laxity with a firm end point, after the debridement, uh, you can close the defect simply, or if you are concerned about the instability after the operation, uh, pull out repair with application may be a good option. And if the definite instability is observed, obviously ligament reconstruction uh, is indicated. Now, uh, I'd like to discuss about the uh, technique of the ligament reconstruction. Uh, in the textbook, the standard technique uh, like this, uh, focus on the reconstruction of the LUCL. However, the recent study emphasized the role of the radial collateral ligament, which is more isometric and is the key ligament for the varus stability. So, uh, and in the lateral epicondylitis, the radial collateral ligament is closer to the ECRB and usually more involved. So I only see that the various instability is more prominent than the PLRI in the lateral epicondylitis patients. So in this sense, I believe that the dual ligament reconstruction is uh, more reasonable uh, than the standard uh, LUCL reconstruction. So I'd like to show the short video of the case with the lateral epicondylitis and complete rupture uh, of the lateral ligament. So after I incise incision, first I 
dissect between the ECRL muscle and the ECRB tendon. And I excise the degenerated nostril lesion. So I have to remove the lateral epicondylite, the bone is exposed. And I found that the ligament is very, very poor, has no function. There's a various instability and also the PLRI. So I will decide to do the ligament reconstruction. So for dual ligament reconstruction, uh, the annular ligament uh, should be exposed by dissecting the remained extensor tendon uh, from the annular ligament. And then I harvested the palmaris longus I made the two slits in the annular ligament. The center slit is for the reconstruction of the radial collateral ligament. And another one is made uh, in the posterior side for LUCL ligament. I pass the tendon through the slits and I fixed the tendon to the annular ligament uh, using the non-observable pull in suture. And then I made the hole in the center of the capitulum here. And I developed the two tunnels and pull the tendon through the two tunnels. When I apply the tension, uh, we can see the stability is restored. The virus and the postural lateral st uh, rotator stability can be uh, achieved by tensioning the uh, graft. And before the final fixation, I close the capsule under the ligament. And I fix here uh, by full tension uh, application. And then uh, it's the final uh, status of the ligament reconstruction. And finally, I cover this ligament with the remained extensor tendon. Okay. So I reported to 40 patients uh, several years ago about this. And now I had the 40 patients, the number of patients are very uh, increasing. Uh, finally, I'd like to discuss about the uh, radial tunnel syndrome. In the textbook, radial tunnel syndrome should be differentiated from the lateral epicondylitis. It's a dynamic nerve compression. The nerve is the deep radial nerve, and the symptom is a deep aching pain, but it is poorly localized and very vague. So the diagnosis is also vague because uh, uh, the lack of the objective findings. So actually, I do not know what is the radial tunnel syndrome and it needs to be released. Uh, instead, I'd like to say about the ganglion. Uh, I often find the ganglion in MRI in the, when I prepare the operation in front of the radial head and the, find that the patient has the another symptoms, uh, which is related to the ganglion is very similar to the radial tunnel syndrome because uh, the mechanism is the irritation of the deep radial nerve. So if the patient has such symptoms, I recommend to remove the ganglion at the same time with the, uh, the 
atopic condylar surgery and open removal is recommended uh, and because you must be careful about it, uh, deep radial nerve. So the summaries of my topics is uh, you must check the MRI uh, before you do the uh, operation. And if there is a large uh, lesion and if the case is the reoperation case or if there is a lateral collateral ligament insufficiency or there's a associated lesion such as the ganglion, open surgery should be considered or is indicated. And if you uh, decide to do the ligament reconstruction, I believe that the double bundle techniques uh, is more reasonable than the elevation reconstruction. And thank you for your attention. Okay, we just uh, finished uh, to hear, to listen to what Professor Park has uh, shared with us. Thank you, Professor Park. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. For those who just joined us, don't worry. We still have the second speaker for the elbow session which, with the similar topic, but in the other perspective, the arthroscopic perspective. We can still do a rendezvous at the discussion with the first speaker. Now let's move to the arthroscopic perspective for the arthroscopic panel. Here we have Dr. Chalavish Chanalit from Thailand. So Dr. Chalavish, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you very much, Erika. Yes. Uh, yeah, I want to share my screen. Perhaps uh, Dr. Park, uh, you Dr. can Dr. stop Park, share the screen. In the bottom of your uh, screen, there, it, there is a green button or the upper part, you can click the stop sharing button. All right, here we are. Okay. Uh, now we can go to Dr. Chalovich. You see my slide? Yes, very okay. clear. Yep, Great. thank you very much. Thank you again, committee, that let me come to share my work. Uh, today's topic is lateral epicondylitis management. I will share my arthroscopic surgery in view. I'm Chola with Telalit Forbes in Akalin Vidor University, Thailand. Uh, as we know that lateral epicondylitis, or another nickname, is a tennis elbow. Uh, the lesion stay on the ECRB tendon, and the tissue is a less that correspond with the pain generator is an angiofibroblastic hyperplasia tissue that Professor Park that used to have to mention before. And the peak incident is stay on the fourth and fifth decay. More than half involved in dominant size. Uh, in the common clinical and symptom that we use to diagnose is the lateral elbow pain, tender at the lower jaw, epicondyle, cosentase positive. The treatment is adequate multi-modality in conservative treatment. Aim to reduce pain and provide progressive load at a stimulant for develop mature and strong tendon. The main treatment is a progressive concentric eccentric resistive exercise. Normally it heal few cases are need surgery for treatment. When we decide to surgery, uh, I think that we need to know the natural history of tendinosis. Uh, the tendinosis, if we plan to conservative treatment longer than six months, the success rate in person, it will be reduced from two digit to be one digit after six months of the treatment. Uh, investigation that I love, I use the MRI, same as Dr. Professor Park said, and I use a coronal cut and choose the pain that stay in the front of the girder of the radio head that why correspond to the ECRB earlier. 
The surgery uh, is the key, is a department and get lit the pen generator tissue. Uh, Professor Park talked about nurse operation already, right? Uh, they show a successfully so, uh, but the bad thing, only the bad thing that we need to cut the good tissue to expose to the degeneration tissue. This is arthroscopic finding. Uh, this is a viewing from the proximal anterior medial portal. You can see the wide variety of capsular defect in there. This is a correspond to the ECRB area. Uh, in the arthroscopic surgery, we go direct to divide and release the ECRB tendon from the inside. So uh, we not need to damage any good tissue in there. So it looks like that have a minimal invasive in benefit in. This is a video clip to show the capsular defect and I can introduce the chamber and radio frequency totally to divide the capsule and also the release of the ECRB tendon in there. Careful not to damage the LCL. Likan Sutan tennis elbow it means a difficult treatment for the tennis elbow, such as a calcific tendinitis. This is a 47 years old female, chronic lateral elbow pain for one year. She was treated with a tennis elbow with a two time steroid injection, two sessions of the shockwave, less medicine, etc. Surprising, uh, her previous doctor never investigated anything there. And I take a look on the pain film. I found the uh, uh, calcified tendon in the lateral side. In the MRI, uh, the lesion corresponding with the pain film with the calcific tendonitis. In the sagittal view, you can see anterior and posterior lump of the soft tissue uh, in the post between radio capital room. So the diagnosis for this case, I said that this have a tennis, uh, sorry, uh, lateral uh, Synovial pica and calcified tendon. This is a video clip to show that uh, it is, is of the front view, have a synovial impinging anterior size. And after we divide and a, a, do the pica excision, we found that they, I found the calcium spill out into the joint. So that means I, I, I start to divide the calcified socket, socket in the tendon too. So I start to divide the tendon, the same as uh, uh, we do the calcified, uh, calcified tendonitis in the shoulder. How about at the back of the elbow, we go to the posterior portal and use a posterior lateral portal for the instrumentation. And we go to divide the olecanon pica, lateral olecanon pica and also the posterior pica. At that the same time, we check the outer humeral joint opening that not have any opening joint. So that means it took the elbow quite stable enough. And they have many literature to show the successful result to improve a function after arthroscopic surgery for the tennis elbow. But I also do the, some paper and show the good result too. Is the lateral epicondiosis is the only cause of the lateral elbow pain? My answer strongly. No, they have a list of the co common cause that can cause a lateral elbow pain in there, like a tennis elbow, pica or synovial pica, cartilage injury and instability. Uh, this is not a new idea. Another concept that have uh, some researcher propose a new clinical model for interpret of the lateral elbow pain. They try to separate two groups of the le uh, lesion. One is extra articular. Most of the time it's tendinosis. Quite classic, it's like a tennis elbow. In this group, longer conservative may be, may be the choice. Intra articular lesion, such as pica or the cartilage lesion. Uh, investigation and aggressive surgical treatment may be, may be aggressive than the first group. Tennis elbow is the most common diagnosis for the lateral elbow pain in clinical practice, are you sure? Uh, so this is a question. So I start to, to survey on the cause of the lateral elbow pain to the arthroscopic aspect. 
uh, I can find out that in the chronic lateral elbow pain that needs surgery, the most common cause of the pain is come from radio capitulum pica. This is a video clip to show that the sinuoid fins go to impinge in between radio capitulum joint. And how about if we include instability together and we found that pica is still the major one and tennis elbow just only 17% in there. Here is a combined lateral epicondylitis and synovial pica. You can see capsular defect in there and also the anterior pica or synovial fringe that can go to in, impinge in the radial capitulum joint. What is a synovial pica? It's a remnant of the septum when we develop elbow joint. They have a four type in there, anterior, lateral, posterior, and the last one is a lateral olecanon pica. This is a die arthroscope view. Uh, uh, we start from extension and go to fraction. You can see that the soft tissue can go in the lead arrow that uh, indicate the edge of the synovial finch. They can go in impinge in lateral capital room joint. In the case that uh, this, this edge of the synovial tissue is thickening enough, sometimes it can wrap on the little head and make a sound like a snap in the elbow. When, the, when we let the dog water in, and you can see that the, the, the synovial finch can go impinge in lateral capital room joint and can cause the pain in there. Here is the picture we don't keep on the, at the back. This here is a, a, a lateral olecanon pica. And right now I divide the posterior pica that stay in the back of the little head. In the case of circumferential pica, that's quite common found in, in, in the pica lesion. I believe nurse posterior is inadequate to detect the aura of the lesion. In my concern is uh, if we just really do the cut on the in the front, maybe we will relieve to have the posterior pica and may cause the pain persist. Another cause of the recalcitrant tendinitis is like a cartilage lesion, such as the, in the, the left picture, you can see the cartilage lesion in the capital room. OCG, even stable or unstable type, and also the cartilation in the little head facet or even in the limb of the little head. Another cause, instability pain. Uh, the pain at the lateral elbow, that collector of instability pain, the collector it will be like a pain related with the pushing activity, such as like a push up or chalice. Long tennis elbow and steroid injection uh, were the cause of instability, and we have uh, many literature to document in there too. And Professor Park also showed the paper in there too. Me also, we, we found many people have steroid injection and have the rupture in there. Uh, when we I reviewed to take a look on the tennis elbow surgery, Morley report incident of radio tunnel syndrome about 15%. Uh, when I approach there, I feel that radio tunnel syndrome in my experience, I believe I, I can remind, and I think that just only one or two cases that I was surgery for the radio tunnel syndrome. So I think that maybe it not, it not exist in this world. So I conduct the study. The question is tennis elbow and instability pain. The first step I conduct the study about the functional instability test in the tennis elbow. We found that 98% show the negative result. So uh, suggest that if we found any functional test instability, such as a postural daily apprehension test positive, you should finding the hidden instability pain in size. Another study that I conduct, I surveyed the 36 cases of chronic lateral elbow pain and 
we find the instability pain with the clinical finding such an examination, such as the functional instability like a apprehension test, push-up test, chair light test, and also review the MRI. And we found that six cases of from the 37, 36 patients found, found instability pain. Here is the, the, the video clip to show that this nurse, uh, she is a nurse and used to take have a four times steroid injection and have a chronic lateral pain and, and refer to me to surgery. This is video clip that to show the post lateral double test positive. I just clean it up the soft tissue and show the capsule and you can see that the, the, they have the a large amount of motion in the posterior lateral test. In that study, I used the family strong cut and reconstruction of the uh, LUCL and have shown the success result. How about the R2 score? Uh, later on, we then move to the R2 score and we also found that R2 score can document out of humeral joint opening in there. Another case also have the widening of the outdoor humeral joint. So we shift to do the arthroscope, LCL reconstruction, and we can stop the opening there. Here is the, of the four up. She can push up better and no any pain. So in the future, I will publish this paper and also the publish the te technique of the arthroscope reconstruction in there. In summary, uh, arthroscopic surgery for chronic lateral elbow pain or tennis elbow is like a minimal invasive and direct attack to the lesion, especially for the tennis elbow and show and have a many evidence support in the successful results. The key is Precisely diagnosis and detect associated lesion is the key to success of the surgery. Uh, the last one, question and answer box. You can put the un, uh, question in there. Thank you. Okay, thank you for Dr. Chalois for sharing your talk. Now we have come to the Q&A session here. We are also have a commentator from Indonesia. I welcome Dr. Iman Aminata to join us. Dr. Iman Aminata, he is an upper extremity surgeon uh, who practice in Fatmawati General Hospital. So for the question, we have several from the floor uh, and for Slido as well. For those who are just join us, uh, please type your question directly uh, to the below chat box in your or to TV panel. So for the both uh, speakers, please. So we have a very interesting question now. Do you always do MRI to evaluate all of your lateral epicondylitis patient? And if you do so, do you think MRI and patient's severity correlate each other? Perhaps we can start with Dr. Park and uh, Dr. Chalois. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, in conclusion, you don't have to check the MRI for diagnosis of the lateral epicondylitis is clinically very evident. And also we don't have to check the MRI before we decide to do the operation because the conservative treatment and the natural healing is the standard treatment. So, but if you decide to do the operation, uh, we need the MRI because of the many associated pathology, yeah. Okay, yeah. from Dr. Chalois, any comment? Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with Dr. Professor Park. Uh, do the MRI is not like a routine, especially for the acute one. Most of the time it's healed by itself. But in the case that I concern another diagnosis such as a pyga or maybe instability, whatever cause in there, or maybe the cartilage lesion, uh, I will do the MRI. Example, in Thailand, <laughs> they're quite common. Even you are just only uh, 15 years old or 20 years old, 
you already diagnosed the tendy cell bowl. Tendy cell bowl is a degeneration. How young, when, why you diagnose uh, uh, for this disease for the, for, for the younger patient? In the case that of Porong, and, and we quite not sure in the diagnosis, maybe the MRI maybe can help. And also MRI can help to detect another lesion in there. Uh, not common to use the surgery for the lateral elbow pain. Okay, Dr. Iman, have we, uh, as we heard from our two panels, one uh, proceed to the MRI just before the surgery to rule out other associated lesion. One is also similarly state that they don't actually, he doesn't actually do MRI as a routine, only to rule out the associated or comorbidities. Are you also doing the same uh, practice in Indonesia? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Erika. I think it's uh, reasonable to save MRI as the last uh, examination since uh, uh, MRI, especially in Asia Pacific, is not very cheap uh, diagnosis tool. So we should preserve it. And it is right that the lateral condylitis is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, MRI is help us to decide what kind of procedure that we need to do when we, when we choose to do the surgery. But for conservative treatment, I don't think uh, MRI will help us. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Iman. Let's move to the second question. So uh, based on our two talks, uh, we can see that um, most of your cases are uh, lateral epicondylitis, perhaps associated with the instability. So uh, could you share uh, how to differentiate uh, elbow pain from lateral epicondylitis only and lateral epicondylitis plus uh, instability? Is there any clue for the, uh, us to differentiate this uh, carefully? or uh, because it seems like they are superimposing each other. Okay, uh, please, for okay. both of our panels. I, I think Could I share? will start first, please. Uh, uh, the list of the cause of lateral elbow pain is it, sometimes it's quite hard to separate together. Uh, the clue for me is uh, have any cause like a steroid injection and the collector of the pain is a changing or not, such as the uh, before that they they most of the time the pain is uh, come from the twist wrist or elbow and make a pain and later on after the steroid injection they they start to have a so painful when they push and also the response of the steroid too from the first time maybe prolong responsive for a couple months. But the later on, later injection, the, the, the short period, the, the period of less bond, it will shorter and shorter and more severe. Uh, maybe I, I, this, I, I, I need this one to be the crew to, to work out in severity in there. And examination, especially like a functional test. Uh, I use the push up and I want apprehension test. If the pain, if the test is positive, I think that I will concern a lot about the insivity that hit them in size. How about Professor Park? Do you see uh, a different kind of pain from those who with instability besides the lateral epicondylitis? Yeah, um, I, I always check the possibility of the instability, but actually the instability the main problem is not the pain, but the, the instability itself. So the, I think the main cause of the pain is the lateral condylitis. So I must, uh, di I like to say that we must differentiate the, the some laxity, still the ligament is functioning and the total rupture. So if you have, when you do the physical examination, the patient has the slight laxity, but still the ligament is functioning. Uh, I think the, we can leave 
without any procedure. But when you find that the, there's a definite clear instability, or if you are suspect about the ligament problem after the operation, then uh, you must open and see and decide what you should do. Okay, regarding the mm -hmm. test, uh, which test uh, do you do first? The true virus or the PLR? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the virus and the people shift. People shift. Uh, it, yeah, this, this instability is the different direction. So you must uh, perform both, okay? Right. And as I said uh, before, the, the virus instability is main for atelopathic condylitis is quite different from the traumatic cases because the mechanism is the uh, slow degeneration or slow involvement of the anterior part of the ligaments. So usually the partial, the patient who has the partial injury, the virus instability is more prominent. Okay, again, uh, Dr. Iman, this is very interesting uh, because uh, we work in Indonesia, which uh, a lot, we saw a lot of patients with steroid injection. So uh, how often in uh, Thailand and Korea about the steroid injection, which come to you with a positive uh, lateral instability in tennis elbow? In Indonesia, we have uh, patients are usually afraid of surgery. So they will definitely choose the injection first. Can you share with us the three? Oh, are you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, same as, as Thailand too, uh, for, for the steroid injection, uh, quite common and quite common to use. It looks like that most of the, most of the time, doctor try to manage is not diagnosis. So when they present with the lateral elbow pain, they injection, they injection and not find out what is the reason of the pain. But whatever, the incident of the instability pain is just only 17% in my, in, my, in my study. It's not so common like a 50 or 60%. So don't worry so much. But I want to mention about the steroid overuse. If you use the overall stick, uh, in the literature, they also show that in systematic review, the long-term result of steroid injection is not, it not happen if you benefit it there. So, why you step on the same step in the same foot step, even if not less bond or in that, or even to have to kill to the patient, okay. uh, it will can cause the uh, complication in that, especially mm -hmm. in instability. So you choose to avoid. How about Dr. Park? Do you still give steroid injection or uh, no at your practice? Yeah, everybody knows about the advantage and disadvantage of the steroid injections. So it's, the advantage is only one, the, the dramatic pain relief. Mm -hmm. So we can use, if the pa pain is very intolerable pain uh, during the conservative period. But uh, as I showed before, before that the, I have this so many instability cases. Yes. And this is increasing. Why? Yes. So we do, do not have the evidence, but we we suspect the steroid is the, the most likely curse. And I think this is quite different from the Western countries. You know? Yes. Unfortunately, we are creating our own uh, problem. How about in Indonesia? Uh, do you see uh, this trend more and more? Uh, yes, in Indonesia still. Uh, we have a, a patient comes with uh, after several steroid injection and instability. However, now uh, lately in the last two or three years, uh, people are starting to use uh, instead of uh, steroid injection, they started to use uh, PRP or uh, dextrose. So, what do you? What is your opinion about this one? Okay, I start with me first. <laughs> uh, when I come back and start the study and I finish the study, after that, I never choose, I never chart any steroid to my patient, <laughs> except calcific tendinitis. That's it. And I never shoot any steroid on my patient. 
And if they want, I send them to Shockwave. And I never, I never choose the steroid in there. How about the PRP? Uh, in the literature, it show questionable. Some is show evidence is good, some show not good. And the bad thing is so painful. I don't want my patient to cry on me. So I let them go to, to the chalk web because they, it's enhanced healing. So, so I think that the chalk web may, and PRP may be the same benefit in there. So yeah, I, I, I used to and use some few, some if the patient accept the condition of painful and no any analgesic in there to help reduce the pain. Very few, not so much. Okay, uh, let me uh, talk about this. Actually, in our country, we use the all of the agent, especially in the local practice. But unfortunately, we do not have the high level evidence about its effectiveness on the healing. And so, it is true that the no agent can fasten the healing, okay? So including the shock wave or everybody. So uh, I'm not sure or it is how much it is effective, but anyway, I, I do not recommend uh, this uh, agent as a definite treatment. All right, uh, Professor Park and Dr. Chalavis and Dr. Iman, thank you for your uh, share with us. Actually, there are many questions from the floor, but unfortunately time is up. Uh, we are very blessed with your sharing today. Now we are going to the shoulder section, uh, which will be moderated by Dr. Chui. Dr. Chui, welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Can you hear me? Yep. Erica, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, yes, you're okay. Yes, yes you're We can okay. hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, so nice to see you again. And uh, now is a uh, our shoulder section and sixth section is uh, we are uh, very happy to invite uh, okay the health slide for noble yeah yes good yeah okay and today we have uh, invite uh, noble uh, Yamamoto. Uh, she is uh, from uh, uh, Tohoku University School of Medicine, Sentai, and she uh, really a good guy and um, is a um, uh, founding member of uh, APOA and also is a ASES co-founding member and uh, also Japan Shoulder Society delegate. And uh, he also uh, write a lot of paperwork, more than 100. That's really hard job. And now I already see Noble. <laughs> and uh, okay, let's welcome Noble to give our uh, lectures. Noble, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's my great honor and great pleasure to talk about shoulder instability. So let me share the screen. Sorry. Can you see my slide? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 
so today I like to talk about to the mainly treatment of the traumatic anterior dislocation. Here is one case, 40 years male. He fell down and uh, had a shoulder dislocation. This is x-ray after reduction. It looks intact. But if CT was taken, you can see the fragment. So this is bony bunkard. Look at the x-ray again. You can see the fragment here. The incidence of the granular defect and the heel sac lesion is very high, 86% and 94% respectively. So bone loss is very common in patients with anterior instability. Here is another case, 22 years old female. She said, doctor, I had a subluxation feeling. X-ray showed the intact. The apprehension sign was positive. MR arthrography indicated no bone control lesion. So this means she is a MDI, multi-directional instability patient. She had greater external rotation angle and general joint laxity was positive, three out of five. So this is contraindication for surgery. In many cases, feature is effective for this patient. For the first dislocation, the which treatment do you choose? Regarding surgery, Arthroscopic bunker repair is a gold standard procedure. Recurrence rate after surgery is 0 to 19%, whereas 30 to 40% after external rotation immobilization. If we consider only the recurrence rate, we can say surgical treatment is better. There is a report warning a recent trend by Hobelius. 257 past dislocators were managed with immobilization. 43% patient had not dislocated. He reported surgery will result in a rate of unnecessary operation of the 30%. This study warned a recent trend is shifting too much to surgery. So what is the surgical indication of the first dislocator? If patient don't want to have a recurrence anymore and patient have a severe dislocation feeling in ADL and large bony bunkard. We need to be careful one more point. Some patients said, I want to have a surgery because I want to return to the prey quickly. Regarding the return to sport, surgery is not superior to the conservative treatment. It's equal because we cannot shorten the healing period. Duration for healing of the bunker region is the same regardless of the kind of treatment. How about immobilization? Do you use a string after reduction? I prefer to use uh, external rotation immobilization, which was developed by my mentor, Professor H. Itoi. The first clinical study reported by Professor Itoi was a great shock. ER immobilization three week was performed in 40 patient. The current rate was 0%. It was amazing. Next, we performed the March Center study Almost 200 patients were enrolled. The current rate was 26% in ER group and 42% in IR group. So what is the indication for external rotation immobilization? The first dislocator and within three days after reduction and young patient less than 40. 
commercially many ER braces are available all over the world. But looking at the literature, some paper reported ER immobilization is effective. On the other hand, some reported not effective. Then we performed a systematic review. Nine studies, more than 800 patients were included. As a result, recurrence rate was 22% in the ER group and 35% in the IR group. It was statistically demonstrated. Now we have ongoing prospective multicenter randomized control trial using abduction and the external rotation brace. Protection brace. By using this protection brace, we can prevent the dislocation position. Several protection braces are commercially available. What is the indication of the protection brace? In season athlete, and if patient don't want to have a surgery. Bus reported the usefulness of the brace for in season athlete. 87% athlete were able to return to their sport. This advantage of this brace is players cannot use it in the game. Thus, there are three options for the first dislocation, ER immobilization, surgery, and protection brace. So which one should be chosen? They have advantage and disadvantage. ER immobilization, less invasive, but recurrence rate is a little bit high. Surgery, low recurrence, but it's invasive. Protection brace, it's good indication for in-season athlete, but recurrence rate is a little bit high. So these are options. They are not competitive with each other. Surgical procedure. There are several surgical procedure. Which procedure should be performed? Arthroscopic bunker repair is a gold standard procedure. In my hospital, 90% arthroscopic bunker repair, 8% latage procedure, 2% lamp research. We reported a good clinical result of the scopic bunker repair. The current rate of the 100 patient was 6%. So surgical indication, traumatic recurrent anterior dislocation, and severe instability feeling. The contraindication of the arthroscopic bunker of repair, a large glenoid defect, large Husa collision, and contact collision athlete. Regarding the large glenoid defect, Backhart reported embodied peer glenoid doesn't candidate for scopic bunk out repair. So which size is critical? We have been involved in the shoulder biomechanics and our study demonstrated 25% of the glenoid width is critical size. So we could draw a line between bone grafting and the scopic bunk out repair, 25%. How about large Husserl lesion? Bipolar lesion is a combination of the glenoid defect and Husserl lesion, and its incidence is also very high, 81%. When considering treatment of the glenoid defect, we just think about glenoid defect because it is related to the mid-range stability. In the mid-range, ligament is lax. We consider the only the glenoid defect. However, when considering the treatment of the Husserl lesion, 
we need to think about bipolar region because this Hillsack region is safe. It's located within the contact area. If there is a granule defect, engagement occur. So how should we evaluate the risk of engagement? We have proposed the concept of the granoid track to evaluate the risk of engagement. If Hillsax region is located within granoid track, it's safe. However, if Hillsax region is out of granoid track, it's risky. The virus of the granoid track was demonstrated to be 83% of the granoid virus. So how should we draw a line of the granoid track? First, we need to find the medial margin of the footprint. Then, the granoid width of the uninvolved side should be measured. For example, in this shoulder, 20 millimeter. So we can calculate the granoid track widths 20 times 83%, 17 millimeter. From the footprint, draw a line 17 millimeter along the cartilage edge. This Hussex region located within granoid track, it's safe, we don't worry about this. So we could draw a line between lamp research, lethargy, and scopic bunker repair, 83%. My friend Giovanni Giacomo named engaging Hussex region, off-track region, and non-engaging Hussex region, on-track region. If Hussex region is off-track region and granoid defect is small, scopic bunker of repair and the lamp research should be performed. However, if both regions big, off-track region and greater than 25%, bone grafting such as latage procedure should be chosen. We can explain this with use of the granoid track concept. This Hillsax region is off-track region, but after bone grafting, granoid track widths increase. So performing bone grafting made off-track lesion to on-track lesion. But there is one question. Just below 25%, 24 scopic bunker repair is really fine. Some surgeon perform the bone grafting for this side of the defect. Surgical decision was done by each surgeon. Just below the critical size is the called subcritical bone loss these days. Definition by Tokish group, no dislocation but clinically decrease in QOL. They reported 30.5% to 20% is subcritical bone loss. They conclude for this side of the defect, bone grafting should be performed. But all the subjects were army in their study. So next question was, how about subcritical bone loss in the civilians? Our data indicated 17.5% is subclinical bone loss and male and contact athletes are risk factors. There's the same question. 82% scopic bunk out repair is fine. Subclinical bone loss should be exist when considering the off-track lesion. Our study showed 75% was subcritical bone loss. Even on track region, if it located close to the granule track line, more than 75%, QOL decrease, so it needs treatment. This is called limb track region, 
named by Dr. Burkhardt. On the other hand, if Hirsax region is located less than 75%, we don't need additional treatment. We named this safe track region. On track region can be divided into two safe track region and limb track region. So let's talk about conduct collision athlete. So what is the characteristic of the contact collision sport? Players have greater external force. One biomechanical study reported impact force during rugby was 2000 Newton. What is the dislocation position of the contact athlete? Pineal analysis using 16 rugby players showed eight dislocator, more than 90 degrees elevation, three dislocator, horizontal abduction. So dislocation position are not always abduction and external rotation. In fact, more common in the mid range. The shoulder of the contact athlete can become stable after scopic bank of repair. Looking at the literature, the current rate after scopic bank of repair in contact collision athlete, 25% to 38%, it's high. Our series of the 100 patients indicated the current rate of the contact athlete was 14%, whereas non-contact athlete, 5%, it's three times. Stabilizing mechanism of the scopic bancal repair is reconstruction of the IGHL. Stability position can be divided into two, end range and mid range. End range means so-called abduction external rotation position. Mid range means other position. In the end range, ligament becomes taut and it contributes to the stability. However, in the mid range, ligament is lax, so it doesn't contribute to the stability. Bancal region is a version of the IGHL. So after bancal repair, shoulder became stable in the end range. On the other hand, in the mid range, stability does not increase even after bancal repair. Adjunct procedure such as rotator interval closure and lamp research contribute to the stability in the mid range. Looking at the biomechanical studies about rotator interval closure, in one report, no effect, but in three reports, effective. How about lamp research? In four reports, no verification. Only one report investigated in zero and 45 degrees mid range. They conclude no effect. So in conclusion, the stabilizing effect in the mid range, rotator interval closure, yes, lamp research still unclear. Anyway, we need the procedure which increases the stability in the mid range for contact collision athlete. We prefer to perform latage procedure because it has a reasonable stabilizing mechanism. We demonstrated it in the biomechanical study. Our data showed the main stabilizing mechanism was a string effect which was provided by both subscapularis and conjoint tendon. 
the contribution of the string effect was 80% in the end range and 50 to 60% in the mid range. In the mid range, stability increased depending on the applied load. By performing Latage procedure, stability increased in the mid range. How about stability in the end range? Stability increased by 13% compared to the intact shoulder. Thus, we can expect the increase of the stability in both end range and mid range. So we are able to say that the Latage procedure is effective for contact athlete. Lastly, let's talk about bony bankard. Surgical procedure is depending on the size of the fragment or small fragment less than one centimeter. If we fix the capsule ligament complex, bony fragment is reduced and fixed to the glenoid at the same time. Fragment can be sandwiched between sutures. Modded fragment. I prefer to perform porcelain method, simple suture method. Sutures are wrapped around the fragment. Some surgeons perform suture bridge technique. This is also one of the options. For large fragment, in this case, we need to pass the suture through the fragment. I prefer to use a suture leader to penetrate the fragment. Strong suture hook bone stitcher is also useful to penetrate the bone. In summary, treatment for the first dislocator, ER immobilization, surgery, the protection brace. These are options, they are not competitive with each other. Contraindication of the scopic bunker repair, large granoid defect, greater than 25%, large heel sac lesion, off-track lesion, contact collision athletes, subcritical bone loss, glenoid defect, 17.5 to 25%, heel sac lesion, limb track lesion, contact collision athlete, they need stability in the mid range and the third procedure is a reasonable procedure for contact collision athlete. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nobu. Uh, yep. I'm Dr. Ashay from India. Uh, so we have a, a very lucid presentation from our dear friend, Dr. Nobu Yamamoto from Japan. And the chat box is already flooded with questions. So uh, if I, I will, with your permission, I'll pick some of them. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, uh, Dr. Yamamoto, sir, uh, mm -hmm. what is the duration of external rotation that you keep your patients when you choose to go for the conservative management? Uh, yeah, external rotation is uh, one of the you know, treatment options for the first dislocator. Now we usually use for the first dislocator and uh, you know, deduction, three days after deduction and the first dislocator and not so severe pain and not so uh, severe instability pain, uh, feeling. And usually three weeks immobilization and uh, now we are improving this uh, conservative treatment. As I said before, during my presentation, abduction and external rotation should be you know, more effective because the just, you know, external rotation is, you know, we reduce the, you know, internal external, you know, direction. 
for the bank of repair. But if we add the abduction position, we can reduce the inferior superior you know, direction. So we believe we have already done the uh, MRI study and now we have ongoing in vivo study. Most like you are saying for three weeks, uh, they should be in abduction and then what is, I mean, what is the further range of movement you allow them and what is the recuperation or the further rehab uh, instructions that you give to your patients when you tell them about this external press? Yeah. And uh, after immobilization, external rotation, range of motion start. And uh, the after, you know, immobilization, the rehabilitation protocol is the same as a uh, scopic bank repair. In our hospital, eight weeks, muscle strength, the start and the return to sport is six months, not three or four months. The six months, same as a scopic bank repair. That's our rehabilitation protocol for external rotation brace. So the uh, second question is, which population will gain the most from the interval uh, rotator interval closure? And uh, if there is a bargain here for the specific population, uh, let's say contact sports. I mean, do you agree with them for doing a, a rotator interval closure in those patients? Uh, yeah, rotator interval closure was in fashion almost 10 years ago. Um, the still, you know, controversial. Some doctor prefer to add uh, rotator interval closure for contact athletes, but no evidence so far. But uh, I uh, performed the rotator interval closure when I detect the anterior laxity, always, you know, under anesthesia, I compare the anterior laxity bilateral. Then, you know, the uh, involved side is more laxity. I add the rotator interval closure for this patient. So that, that's my indication. Uh, Dr. Kui, you want to add uh, uh, to the comments and questions, please? Yes, and uh, I also uh, think the laxity is also important for the dislocation patient because uh, in my cases, almost uh, more than 8%, 80%, they have the laxity of the shoulder. So I think, uh, uh, and also according to Pascal, and if the patient have the laxity, and the recurrent rate after banker repair also really high, uh, almost three times as, as, as usual. So uh, uh, for this kind of patient with laxity of the joint, I think we should pay more attention. And uh, also a recurrent rate is high. So uh, like, uh, uh, like the glenoid track and uh, 80, 83% is a normal person or the laxity patient. Is the same or not? So I think if the patient likes the hyper laxity and the hyper abduction external rotation, I think the glenoid track is also narrow. So it should be more easy to dislocate. So what do you think about um, uh, uh, the laxity uh, effect to the track? Noble. Yeah, that, that's very good to, you know, point, uh, very important point. And uh, if we, I perform the bank repair, always think about the laxity of the, in the patient. And if patient has an anterior laxity, I add, add uh, you know, capsule application and also sometimes the rotator interval closure, especially the teen Asia, you know, early teen Asia, they have a laxity. So we need to, you know, consider the laxity. And when you think about the, the granular track concept, as you said, 83% is a mean value. So we, we don't consider the laxity. So after that, we already published the, the paper we investigate the relationship between range of motion and granular track. And we found horizontal extension motion is affected 
by the granular track. So horizontal uh, extension motion affects the granular track most. So, and the range of motion reflect the, uh, you know, laxity. So smaller uh, the range of motion, external rotation, for example, 60 degrees and 90 degrees, granular track is different. So we need to consider the laxity range of motion when we consider the uh, granular track virus. And uh, then we found uh, already published that we called the granular track table showing the relationship between horizontal extension angle and the granular track table. So it includes the laxity and the range of motion. But uh, in addition to that, we need to consider the other the point, for example, dominant side, sports level, and what kind of sport. Then, so we need to evolve the granular uh, track concept more. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you for your uh, comment. Uh, Dr. And Nobu, the, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, you were saying, Doctor. Yes. It's okay. It's okay. So I, I just uh, say, if not just laxity, like uh, circus, like uh, three plus, it's really highly laxity, and uh, you still do the, uh, you think the um, uh, inter, 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 so I see closer is enough for this kind of patient. But you know, she has a bunker region. That's important. If you know bunker region, I don't touch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, bunker, bunker region, region and region. Uh, but if patient, you know, the, the borderline between the mainly traumatic, uh, you know, dislocation or mainly, you know, the laxity MDI, you know, borderline mm -hmm. is sometimes difficult to differentiate, but. Uh, in that case, two plus three plus circus positive. That's mainly, I think, the MDI based and the anterior instability. So first, I try to, you know, give harder rehabilitation. Then it failed. So I recommend surgery. First, I tried the physio first for this, you know, patient. Okay. There, there is okay. one question in the and chat box. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, so, taking to the technical aspect of uh, the 83% of orthoscopic bank art done at your centers, Dr. Nobu, we would like to know uh, uh, how do you do your uh, IGHL shifts and uh, what are the final points uh, you would like to give the audience uh, who are uh, uh, rather new and uh, getting some experience in orthoscopic bank arts? Can you please elaborate and give your, share your experience? Yeah, and uh, that's very important to, you know, scopic bunker repair is a reconstruction of the IGHL. So how we deconstruct the IGHL complex is very important. Always I uh, delete the IGHL complex until seven o'clock and then shift to the superior as much as I can because the IGHL attachment is, you know, different in each patient. We already published the anatomical study. We believe IGHL attachment is three or four o'clock. Of course, the 6%, 60% IGH attached at three o'clock. But in some patients, three to five, some patients, five to six o'clock. So IGHL attachment is uh, you know, different in each patient. That's why during surgery, I grasp the IGHL and uh, shift to the superior as much as I can. Then I confirmed, you know, in this, you know, abduction position, IGHL is became taught or not. Then I confirmed, you know, my surgery should be the successful or not. So shift to superior as much as we can and check, you know, this position. Then we confirmed IGHL reconstructed became taught or not. I think that's an important point for this surgery. So uh, it is not just the uh, uh, anchor placement as a routine, uh, the way it is advised that you should place it 530. You should actually see for the tightness of the IGHL in abduction and external rotation during surgery. That is a very important thing. So uh, how your uh, placement of anchors is, I mean, uh, 
uh, does that determine like you put your first anchor in the position of tightness of your IGHL at three o'clock? Is that your first anchor? That's what you want to say? Yes, uh, usually I put uh, you know the anchor. Most inferior anchor is uh, five to five thirty, and then you know four three two and uh, one o'clock interval. But uh, and usually at least three or four anchor, it's been on the you know the attachment of the IGHL. So important point is uh, you know number of the uh, anchor, but you know more important is you know. How can we shift to the superiority? That's more important. Okay. Dr. Kui, you want to ask any questions? Yes, and uh, I have a lot of questions I want to ask, but uh, the time is up. <laughs> so I think uh, the shoulder dislocation is really challenging problem. And we need a total day to discuss. So uh, I think we should have next chance. Okay. Thank you, Tomo. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nobu. Thank you. Thank you, Aishin. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, yeah, thank you. I hope thank next you. time to Beijing. Yes. We'll discuss a total day for that. <laughs> there is, I mean, there is a never-ending session to shoulder. <laughs> okay. Would the Inho like to conclude? Unmute, unmute Inho. Yes, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And it was very uh, instructive and meaningful webinar so far. At the end, I would like to share uh, a couple of uh, information with you all. Um, here first, I would like to inform you all that the APOA Congress in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia is planned 29th to 31st of July, 2012. And this is going to be a mixed hybrid con conference so that we can have face-to-face -face meeting together with the online. So if you can, uh, Put your uh, web uh, address in a web page. You probably can find more information about the 21st APOA uh, Congress in Kuala Lumpur. And please mark your calendar for the next masterclass uh, APOA shoulder and uh, reverse shoulder webinar, which is planned Saturday, 17th April 2021. I will have very interesting topics about reverse total shoulder replacement and world-renowned speakers are ready for these talks. So we will cover from biomechanics to the surgical tips and good clinical guide which design of a reverse you can pick up and how to deal with failed reverse total shoulder at the end. So this is going to be a very interesting uh, uh, webinar at the end. So uh, uh, thank you very much for your joining. And I would like to pass to our president, uh, Ted Ma, for the closing. Well, thank you very much, uh, all the speakers, moderators, and commentators. Uh, it has been a very informative and certainly discussion on controversial topics like tennis elbow. It's been very exciting tonight. I have certainly learned a lot from the speakers, and certainly I hope you have the same. Uh, looking forward to uh, meeting you soon in the next uh, masterclass in shoulder, reverse shoulder surgery. In particular, uh, those of you who would like to join us as members, uh, please contact myself or Ingho. I can look on the, apps on the website uh, for addresses. And I'm uh, looking forward to your future participation. Uh, I would like to thank the speaker in the usual way, putting a thumbs up and say good night, everybody. Uh, good night from Australia. Bye bye now. Good time, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Okay. okay. Thank you. We're, we're close now. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Eric Cup.